I want to thank you for joining us for our Tuesday Bible study. We continue our Hebrews, our lessons from Hebrews. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your many blessings today, for this opportunity to open up your Holy Scripture, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, we skip in our lessons from Hebrews in our lectionary all the way from chapter 2 to chapter 4. We kind of missed a whole lot when we look at and read it as a lectionary. Let me just tell you some of the things. First of all, the first thing that the author mentions is that uh, he talks about God's ultimate revelation. And we ultimately revel revelation. There you go. Let's go to revolution. Revelation. So God's ultimate revelation is in Jesus Christ. That's who we know. We are kind of on the end with this. We know that this is Jesus. He's arguing again that it's Jesus. We believe that to be true, but then he also goes on to talk about who this Jesus is. He is God's son and our brother. We missed this part of a lesson. So this is kind of what you skipped. Uh, this is chapter 2, a little bit later in chapter 2. And then the third thing that we missed leading up to today's lesson is he lays out for us the way of faith. The way of faith. And that, um, that believers are focused upon Jesus, the high priest. And that kind of leads us into today's lesson where we look at Jesus, the one who ultimately is the way of faith. And so we're in this section right now in terms of uh, following along, if you would, the handout. Now, the handout is posted on our Facebook page. You're welcome to download that if you would like, so you can kind of see the outline and the thought process of the author of Hebrews. So again, we've worked our way down to this part, the way of faith, and ultimately that way of faith is going to be uh, faith, of course, in Jesus Christ. And so we begin today's lesson, verse 11 through 16. The author writes, Therefore, make every effort to enter into the rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to its dividing soul and spirit, to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Okay, so the author, by the way, is including, this is the thing I, I, I like about this author, includes him or herself. Again, remember how we mentioned, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Could have been a female, could have been Phoebe, Phoebe. kind of Schroeder's, Schrodinger's cat. We don't know. As long as we don't know, why not? Could have been. So him or herself in the indictment or in the charge, the accusation, the concern. The concern, again, is that by your example, you might lead somebody astray. Don't do that. But the author is including him or herself in that concern. And this is something I really learned about preaching a long time ago because I used to preach at people. A lot of preachers preach at people. Get your life together. You need to do this. And, you know, that's certainly what uh, I remember in the 80s and the 90s, the moral majority, they were always pointing their finger about how everybody else had to get their act together. But, of course, whenever they made mistakes, oh, well, you've got to be merciful to us. Well, for goodness sakes, you know, uh, I don't like to point my finger at people because I don't know what you're struggling with. I do know what I'm struggling with, and this is truly revolutionary in the way I preach uh, changed my way of thinking about it. I no longer preach at people. I open up the scriptures and say, what is God trying to tell me? And then if you can learn something from what God is trying to tell me, that's just fantastic. How does God want to change me? Not how does God want to change you, how does God want to change me? And so this is what the author is trying to tell us here by including him or herself in this warning that None of us are above going astray, okay? And so rather than preaching at somebody, we need to take a stock of our own lives to make sure that we don't fall away. Don't fall away. Now he's thinking very, or the, the author's thinking very specifically in this 
case of falling away from Jesus back into a Judaism without Christ. This is called the book of Hebrews for a reason. It's written to Hebrew people, Jewish people, who are learning about Jesus being the Messiah, about living in the Messianic age. Don't fall away and just become, once again, a Jew without Jesus. Okay, this is the falling away that he's concerned about. It goes on, verse 12. He says, for the word of God is living and active. He says several things about this. Three characteristics. Uh, verse 12, this is again, verse 12. 12, about the word of God. About Jesus, okay? Now, we usually identify Jesus with the word of God. And uh, the author here is identifying everything that God has spoken with the Word of God, which includes Jesus. So Jesus is kind of a subset of the things that God has spoken throughout the universe, okay? So the first thing he says, these words are powerful. It's one, living and active. This is not just a dead word on a page. These words can touch you and transform you and change you when the Word of God gets in your life. It's sharper than a two-edged short, sharper than... Say that one fast. Sharper than a two-edged sword. The sword can penetrate anything. There is nothing that can hide, nothing that is safe. It can literally separate soul and spirit and biological organs. You know, again, these types of things. I, um, uh, it just it can cut through all the garbage of life, okay? You just can cut through it. So, uh, and then he goes on. Uh, not only can it cut through these things, it also, through the Word, God judges us. Sees us clearly for who we are. That means that we come naked before God. We've got nothing that we can hide. We are uncovered before God. In fact, he goes, the author goes on to talk about this sharper than a two-edged sword. Very graphic imagery here in that next verse, verse 13. He says, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare. Now, that doesn't sound very graphic to you, but in Greek, it comes across as much more graphic. It's a flaying open. How about I read it that way? Everything is, flayed, or everything is uncovered and flayed open before God. So again, going with this sharper than a two-edged sword, you are basically an animal that's dissected and cut open. God sees everything. There's nothing inside of you that can be hidden from God. And so we will be called to give an account of how we've lived our lives. Are we, by our actions and attitudes, causing people to fall away? So if we don't want to go before God with something hidden, there's a very simple thing to this. Don't be a chameleon. Don't try to hide. Open yourself up to God. So that's the beginning part of our lesson, but then the author goes on. Therefore, so we're going to go take a look at verse 14. Okay? So, don't be the cause, the reason for somebody stumbling. God sees everything in your life, so don't even bother trying to hide it. Okay, but then he goes on, therefore, we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. Stop trying to hide. Stop trying to retreat back into your Judaism without Jesus, because by doing so, you might lead people astray. Hold on to this, Jesus, because who is Jesus again? Jesus is the, not a, the great high priest. There you go, the GHP. <laughs> all right. You don't want to sit and have me write all these things. Great high priest. There you go. Now, let me tell you what is behind the author's thought process with this. In the olden days, in Judaism, 
once per year, one of the high priests was chosen to go into the Holy of Holies, which nobody saw the Holy of Holies. It was completely black, completely dark back there. There was a curtain that separated from the rest of the worship space. And there they would uh, make sacrifice to God on behalf of the nation of Israel. Okay? Once per year. The great high priest doesn't do it in a temple made with human hands. This great high priest, Jesus, does it where it really counts in heaven. Okay? This appointed high priest went to the heavens, the thing that separates us from God, and became the one who stands in the gap on our behalf, because that's in essence what a priest does. Okay? He went through the heavens on our behalf. Jesus, the Son of God, we go on. Let us therefore hold firmly to the faith that we profess. So what is the faith that we profess? Again, this is all very creedal language. Remember how we said this in the very first lesson? This is almost like the, uh, the second article of the Apostles' Creed. He's going to go in more of this creedal type of language here about who Jesus is in verse 15. So who is this Jesus? We don't have, first of all, in the negative, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, but yet was without sin. So who is Jesus? Jesus is the one who sympathizes with us. So remember the context. Our temptation is to fall away, to turn back to a Judaism without Jesus, and thereby leading people astray. Why would people do that? Because they were afraid. There was a great deal of persecution. Now, we think of persecution coming from Rome, and that's actually not true. Christians, most Christians, in particular Jewish Christians, suffered more at the hands of other Jews than they did at the hands of the Romans. I think sometimes the persecution that Christians suffered at the hands of the Romans is way overblown compared to what, it, what, what uh, we think it is. I mean, we have this image that Christians were on a regular basis being uh, 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 relegated to the uh, lion's den and, and, or ripped apart for pleasure for the Roman audience. That just, it did happen. I'm not going to say it didn't. But that was not as often as you think it might. The real persecution took place at the hands of other Jews who persecuted people who believed in Jesus. And so it was a temptation to turn back. And he says, Jesus sympathizes with us. Remember, he suffered a great deal as well. Because he sympathizes with us in our weakness. He knows that you're tempted to just turn back and become a chameleon and turn back to the way things are. Weakness, by the way, this is not a sin. Jesus, too, suffered through times of weakness. He got through it. He's our great high priest. He shows us the way. So oftentimes we think of, uh, you know, weaknesses as sins. That's just life. I have a lot of weaknesses. It's not a sin. They're just things I'm not good at. Okay? And I struggle with. They're frailties. Because he knows our frailties and how hard it is for us, he's provided for us a way to get through it. And how did he do it? He was tempted, we are told, in every way that we were. Oh, don't you remember the story about the night in which he's betrayed? The great tears that Jesus cried just to get out of this. He was weak. He was tired. He didn't want to have to do this. He was frightened. But he did for us. He was tempted in every way. So Jesus is sympathetic towards us and understands that the temptation is to turn our back in the way in which we've been going. And then he goes on. Um, verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find the grace to help us in our time of need. So we got the great high priest who sympathizes with us. We can turn to this great high priest in our time of need and do what? So he says, let us approach him. That's kind of an amazing thing. 
Who in the world would think that we have the right to gain access to the throne of God? We do because of what Jesus has done. Now, in the Old Testament, you think of Moses and those who went before. Are you kidding me? Only Moses had access to God. Those whom God has chosen. You and I now have access to the throne of God. How spectacular that is. So we no longer need to depend upon any other high priest. We can go straight to God. We can go to the approach the throne of grace, it says. This is God's sovereignty represented here. This is the audacity that we have as Christians, that we can go straight to the throne of God. Jesus parted the veil and opened up the kingdom of heaven, the holy of holies, to you and me. Boy, talk about the audacity of Jesus. Who does Jesus think he is? <laughs> He's the true high priest, the one that stands in the gap for us. Therefore, we can approach with confidence, knowing what? That he will provide for us in our time of need. That he will give us grace. See, we're weak. We struggle. We might want to turn back. Things may get hard. But we throw ourselves at Jesus' feet, the throne of grace upon which he sits. And there we receive grace and mercy to get us through. It's not a sin to be weak. Okay? To be tired. To be frustrated. All of these things. It's not a sin. It's just part of life. But what do we do when we struggle with these things? We give ourselves over to God. And we ask for God's mercy to help us through. See, you can't do it on your own. You cannot get through this life without Jesus. Because you try, you're going to fall back just like the people whom the author is referring. You're weak. You're tired. You're worn out. you got nothing left. You can't face this life. So we go straight with boldness to the throne of God. And he gives us the strength to get us through. Following Jesus is going to cost us something. By the way, there will be a day where you'll be tempted to turn away as well. Being a disciple is not a promise of an easy life, despite what these name it, claim it preachers preach. Don't listen to them. They got it easy because they're, they're mooching off poor people and taking all their money and living in their million dollar houses. <laughs> it's a pyramid scam. That's what the name and claim it doctrine is all about. A difficult life, one filled with relentless temptations, is a normal experience for a Christian who follows Jesus Christ. We will all have to face that someday. We have the privilege of being able to go boldly before the throne of God and receive help directly from God to help us resist these seasons of temptations. Wow, let's give thanks, shall we? Heavenly Father, this is such a powerful lesson. It's probably appropriate. We all really need this lesson today. Because we are tired and we are weak and we're filled with, uh, life is filled with temptations and we're just, we just want to give in to our, our most wickedest of demons, I guess you could say, that are sitting on our shoulder. But God, let us come to the throne and we ask that you would give us the grace and mercy to represent you as difficult as this may be in this life. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Be bold. Go to the throne of grace. And God will help you through. Amen.